Good day, folks. It's Tony Fortunato from the technology firm and NetAlly. Today, we're going to talk about the challenges of packet captures. This goes back to the good old garbage in, garbage out routine. But guess what? If you don't have garbage in at all, you'll have nothing out. So I'm going to show you tips and tricks and all sorts of ways of capturing packets and things to be aware of. Enjoy. I have to admit, at first glance, this video has a lot to unpack. So I encourage you, if you do want to take your time, just pause the video and take a look around. I'm going to cover just some of the main points for you. First being Endis. So if you have a Microsoft workstation and you're using Microsoft's Endis drivers, which you are, you will not see physical level errors. So if you had um, some kind of issue with full half duplex, cabling issues, uh, noise on the line, that kind of stuff, and the packets get zanked, well, guess what? You're not going to see that. So you have to be careful about that, number one. Number two, when the packets get to your computer, are you using a tap or using a span monitor port? So span monitor, again, will not let those packets get there. A tap will. So now we have that to contend with. And guess what? If you have a tap, are you Ethernet attached or your USB attached to that tap? Both have their pros, both have their cons. If you have port security on your switches, being Ethernet attached, will that trip your port security? The USB attached probably won't set off that port security. So these are all little things you got to worry about as you traverse your network and try to figure out where taps belong. Now, the moral of the story is once you figure out what you like and where you like it, you should probably have a long term plan for taps in your network when you troubleshoot. All right, location, location, location. I cannot stress this enough. I've run into this a lot of times. I just ran into this uh, last week. So there's a big difference between packet loss and latency, and I want to walk you through this slide. It may help you troubleshoot in your environment. So we got a client here on the left-hand side. we got a server here on the right-hand side, and the client sends a request to the server. And now the server's going to send back four packets. One, two, three, and four doesn't make it. So then guess what? I resend four. So from the server side of the fence, one, two, three, four, four means retransmission. Pretty simple, right? But... From the client's perspective, one, two, three, big delay, because that was that packet that never made it, and then the retransmission, four. So from the client side, it looks like the server and or network was slow. So now you're going to go off on a tangent trying to find out why everything is slow. This is not a slow issue. This is a packet loss issue. So the way to fix this, make sure you are near the sender, or if you are near the client, make sure you are sending. It's that simple. That way you won't miss a possible packet loss issue or misinterpret it as a latency issue. All right, so this slide is a little bit tricky, so I want to walk you through this step by step. It has to do with TCP IP offloading. Now, that revolves around this whole concept of checksums and who's calculating the checksum, and it really matters. So if the checksum is offloaded, that means Wireshark or your packet capture tool of choice will see the packet with this pseudo TCP IP checksum value, which is not correct. So if you have checksum um, correction or validation enabled in any of your tools, it will actually say, hey, this has got a checksum error. Now, when you think about this logically, that can't be true, because how can you have a checksum error in just a TCP header, but IP is fine, layer two is fine. If it was truly the packet being corrupted, for example, everything would be trashed, and you would probably see a preamble steamrolled all over the packet. So chances are these are good packets. Now, the only other thing that really throws people for a loop, this also affects the size of packet being sent. So what will happen is if you're going to upload a, a one gig file, you might actually see in your Wireshark trace a 65 kilobyte packet, which more than likely is not true. It doesn't even exist. But if you had offloading disabled, the transmit, the TX side of it, it would have sent the proper sized frames, either you know 1518, 1500, whatever the MSS allows you to send within that packet. This is kind of important because now if you have the correct size packets leaving the machine, then the acknowledgements will line up and you won't get a bunch of red herrings. So please be careful when you troubleshoot and you have TCP offloading enabled on your machine, I encourage you to either be the third person in the party on a tap or a span port, or make sure you disable offloading on the transmit side. 
Just like I said a moment ago, this whole checksum routine, you can see when offloading is on, you get these big, huge packets, right? When if you were on the wire and you were on a span port or a tap or a third party actually capturing the packets, you would have not seen one packet. You would have seen many smaller ones that make this up. And this confuses some analyzers because they'll see one big fat packet leave and a whole bunch of acknowledgements come back and you know it'll throw it off. And this is kind of important because you don't want to waste a whole lot of time chasing down things that don't exist. So whenever you see this, I would encourage you to go check your offloading. If you want to triple, triple, double check your work, make sure you use a span port, take another trace and compare them and I'm sure you'll see they're different. So this video goes back to my famous little speech regarding know your tools. So in this case, I want you to understand how many packets your laptop, notebook, whatever you're capturing with, how much can it actually receive? The key here is using a tool that generates packets that you trust. Then you'll know exactly what was sent and exactly what was received. In this example, you can see I got 64 byte packets, 128 byte packets, sent 100,000 of them at 30% utilization. Windows had a hard time with it. Linux had a hard time at 64 bytes, not so much 128. I'm going to give you some advice. If you are on a network for the first time, I encourage you to use a, an actual real packet capture device because chances are you might be dropping packets and then you'll think your network is dropping packets when it's you. Once you get familiar and comfortable enough with what's going on on the network, then sure, use your laptop, your notebook, whatever you want to use. But if you ever do a capture and you find out you're dropping packets, I would question that and I would use another tool just to verify that. In this case, um, I used various sizes on the left hand side with the same utilization and that's what I'm going to suggest to you is that if you do have a busy network, for example, a one gig network running at 30% utilization, chances are you've got a lot of broadcast multicast and that's going to fall within the 128 256 byte range. Chances are your Windows device will drop a few packets. So it's important for you to understand what the limitations of your tool is before you get into it. Good old packet slicing. Now this is a great little concept we used in the old days when we didn't have a whole lot of disk space and we wanted to capture for a long period of time. It's coming back again. Why? Because of the exact opposite scenario. We have very fast networks, a lot of data. It's not so much a disk space issue. It's more of a person issue. You have to actually analyze all these packets and it takes up a lot of space and your tools probably don't like that. So if you don't believe that, try to open up a one gig trace file in Wireshark and you'll find out exactly what I mean. So packet slicing will basically take so much of that packet and save it instead of the entire one. Now, I encourage you to start with 128 bytes. That'll give you the layer two address, layer three address, layer four address, and the application header. That's a really good start. Now, if you really know what you want, you can always do some kind of custom setting and type in, you know, 621 bytes if you know exactly where that is. But why do we do it? Well, like I said a moment ago, it's because some tools don't like digesting that much data. But the other thing is, what if the data is sensitive, right? What if this is a transaction? Now, you may argue that it's encrypted, but you know what? Better be safe than sorry. Sometimes there's legal ramifications around what you're capturing and you want to make sure you don't have the payload for whatever reason. So you just chop it off at the header. You don't even want the data. Many times the data is unreadable. It's a VPN, it's SSL, it's HTTPS, whatever it happens to be, you can't read it anyways. So you might as well not even capture it. So I encourage you to take a look in your favorite tool and find out where these settings are. Now in Wireshark, it's called SnapLen, S-N-A-P-L-E-N. -E and the default is the full size, but you can easily click that. You can change it to 128, 256, whatever you want and get familiar with what slice works best for you. It's different for every application, but as I said before, to start, 128 is a good start. The good old capture filter. Now, everybody who's done any kind of packet capture in their entire career will know what a capture filter is. So that'll limit what the tool actually captures. It's a great way of reducing the amount of traffic coming in, reduces your file sizes, so on and so on and so on. The only problem with capture filters are when you start troubleshooting, you honestly don't know what the issue is, right? So the last thing you want to do is gamble and zero in on something and miss a bunch of other stuff. Now you may argue that I know what the server is, I know what the client is, so I should be good to go. But think about it. There could be devices such as routers and firewalls on your network that send 
other packets back to you, like for example, an ICMP, destination unreachable, fragmentation required, try this size. That's an ICMP packet coming from an intermediate device, not the client, not the server. So you would probably miss that. Again, I encourage you when you start troubleshooting, get it all. And then once you get familiar and comfortable, sure, go to town, get a capture filter in there. So as I said, it's one of the easiest ways to reduce your number of captured packets and your file size. Now, if you do want to start with a capture filter and you're new to it, start at layer two. So a Mac filter, and then when you get comfortable enough, go to layer three, because you might find out using IPv6 instead of IPv4. That also helps a lot. And the last thing is, as I said, when in doubt, do not use a capture filter because you might miss things like ICMP and learn where you can save your capture filters in your various tools. That way you don't have to recreate that same filter every single time. Develop a library that'll help you out in the long run.